I got a story to tell. I got a story to tell. All right, hit me with a story. Well, I know you like controversy. I know you like touchy subjects dealing with race. And this one actually deals with the afterlife, too. But to start all this out, I guess I'll just lay the, the whole scene here. Well, we were in Louisiana this weekend. Mm-hmm. We went to one of the most haunted locations in America, the Myrtles Plantation. Okay. The Myrtles Plantation. A bunch of people got murdered there. Most famously, Mr. Woodruff, a white lawyer, cut the ear off his female slave who he was having sex with and then had her on the property. Cut the ear off? Cut the that, ear was off. that common practice? or Good question. Yeah, I, I think he was just really influenced by Van Gogh. <laughs> no, he he caught her eavesdropping, eavesdropping uh, on one of his business one of these conversations. Things, like they cut your hands off for stealing. Yeah, yeah, Damn. and and uh, I I think I mean nowadays a lot of insecure dudes do stuff to keep their bitch in check. And he, I mean he was having sex with his chick, so you wouldn't think he would have done that, but he did to keep. Well, he hung her right after. I thought. Yeah, he did. So I mean, he's kind of not invested in her looking good at that point, right? You know, it wasn't a loving relationship. You so you're say. seeking out plantation narratives and then dragging your black friend along to sort of just deal with it i don't like how you put that <laughs> we we brought a black friend because right. we we thought his take on it would be important it's probably better than just you going alone yeah yeah absolutely you know, just just for comfort reasons too also he's a big dude security purposes okay. against um, anybody who might have any desire to cause us pain or a specter i was thinking that when i was watching your your current newest video where you basically go to like a very uh you know conservative republican school and then you just basically like act as offensive as possible but you weren't really like playing the woke card so much as you were being more offensive than the Republicans, right? Like you were you were calling attention to this like Mormon atrocity where they killed a bunch of Indians. That's me, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I shed light on stuff. I you know, the whole white male affluent exterior is really just my Trojan horse for social justice. When I was looking at all these dudes on this Mormon university, I'm just like I would feel so safe in this place. I'm sure they have almost no violent crime. I'm sure they have no murders. What a what a place to live. It's famous for you being able to leave your bike unlocked, your car doors unlocked, your MacBook out on the table at the library when you really? go to the bathroom. There is almost zero crime. That's one of the statistics associated so with the school. So why is everybody just laughing at the Mormons? I mean, come on. Like if they if they have that going for them yeah. then that makes me feel like okay they, they've got something going for them i don't want to totally write them off i mean obviously the religion is total bullshit but like the cultural mm-hmm. mores that come along with it mm-hmm, mm-hmm. well they have a tendency toward inbreeding and yeah. that's been and a see, big I like thing. that too you like that yeah keep the genes pure as a young kid my mom i remember still her having explained to me that i couldn't marry my cousin and you still want to no. You haven't let go of the dream. No, I just like don't even barely remember which cousin I was talking about. But you know, as you a got kid, a lot of hot cousins. Because okay, when you're a kid, you're talking about like you know that people are married, right? You're looking at your mom and dad, you're like, oh, they're together, they're mom and dad. And then you're like, Well, I'm a boy. Maybe I need a wife or I need a girlfriend yeah. or whatever. And so but you don't really know anyone mm-hmm. when you're like four. Yeah. You know, you just don't have that many friends. So for me, I was like, I want to get married to this girl that was my cousin. Mm-hmm. My mom mm-hmm. had to like kind of tell me like People, and that's a weird thing to explain to a kid. Yeah. Like genetics are going to make your kid retarded, and that's bad. You can't. You just kind of got to shoo them away. Yeah. You just got to. Yeah, Daniel Haleg was the girl I wanted to get married to, my babysitter's daughter. But before that, it was a little incestuous. I remember one night hiding under the covers in my mom's bedroom so I could see her boobs when she got out of the shower. Your mom's boobs? Yeah. I remember seeing my mom's boobs being absolutely horrified. I, I was young. I, I was like six. I remember just seeing her bush and just being like, Jesus Christ, I wish I was dead. You know. Maybe my mom's hotter than yours, or maybe I had lower standards at age four, but I don't know. To me, it's just like that's an awkward thing. And I have that same memory of like seeing my dad's dick when I was a kid and just being like, holy fuck. It looked huge. I, I didn't thought it, it was huge. It's and huge. In retrospect, I'm going to go out on a limb and say probably not. But at the time, it seemed like a fucking elephant trunk. Oh, you got your thing from somewhere. See, I know I my dad's know. dick wasn't huge because, you know, mm-mm, mm-mm. you know, I had, you, you remember the story you told about. Wait, was it you? You were jerking off to some porn and then you figured out. No, that was Lush. Yeah. <laughs> Lush was jerking off to some porn and then he realized that one of the guys in the porn was his homie. That's not bad. Or gay. But he just like kind of got freaked out and he had to like close the computer and like walk away and everything like that. Yeah. And like, I understand that. But the other day that happened to me when I was looking at Twitter and Flacco posted what I believe would be like a leaked clip 
from Sauce Walker, who's a rapper. Just know he's a rapper from Texas. He wears crazy-ass clothes. He dresses crazy. He got all these beads in his hair, whatever. He talks like the craziest fucking entertainer, carnival barker type dude you ever met in your life. Hey, what's going on, Danny? My lady, you? <laughs> you know, he's just like the craziest dude you've ever seen in your life. And I always knew that he like managed some OnlyFans girls, right? And then so Flacco just posts a clip of him just straight up. You got some white bitch bent over, and he he's naked. He got a six pack. He's doing better than me in that regard. And they he's got- just laying laying dick down. His dick definitely seemed like a long one, but it wasn't like a mega thick one, okay. from what I could tell. That's so. that's right here. Respect. Sort of what I'm working I, I with. I pride myself. No, I think it was probably way bigger than yours. But <sighs> but I pride myself on being very fair when it comes to dicks. So you know, I pretty, was gonna refute that, especially because the ladies in the room right now. I was gonna stop you, but then <laughs> yeah. I remember in episode two, I showed you my erect cock. In good lighting. Yeah, yeah. I can't say anything. I wasn't too wild. This plantation. Yeah. Well, we hear, before we go, from a ghost hunting buddy of ours named Chad Kalick. He's big on a show on A&E or one of those programs called Paranormal State. This guy's been in the business forever. He goes on tours and he sells out little theaters. He's so big in this space. Doing, like, make-believe paranormal shit where he pretends the shit's haunted? It, mostly puppet shows. What? Really? Of ghosts. No, I'm joking. Oh. But he just shows tape. I mean, it's, I think the ghost hunting thing is bullshit. I'm yeah. sure he brings everybody into a little theater in Westwood and goes, here's a photograph from the Queen Mary. And if you'll direct your attention to the top left corner, aha, a blurry smudge that mm, I think is a woman's face. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm assuming that this all is. That's, just, it, it pretty much like, exclusively appeals to the dumbest people on earth. Uh, the fat girls who believe in astrology yeah. and fat dudes with ponytails. People who don't require any sort of evidence in order to hold extremely strong beliefs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, He tells us that one of the key tools in a ghost hunter's tool belt is the ability to shit talk the specters because that increases their level of activity. It gets them real riled up and feisty at them. And then you're more likely to capture something. Well, he told me that, and all of a sudden, all my hatred toward the genre of ghost hunting is gone. And I realize we're going to a haunted spot, and we're going to talk shit. Even better if that shit talking is racially charged. Okay. So before we go on the tour of the haunted mansion that night, I'm thinking, King Croc, my black buddy, what can you say to the ear-cutting, hanging Mr. Woodruff? the guy who did those things to that slave girl, what can you say to him that's going to get him so fucking pissed off that he's going to appear in our YouTube video and make me some coin? Well, we turn to this clip for inspiration. This is a clip of a defensive tackle for the 49ers talking shit to a 49ers journalist who was criticizing the player's play. Let's let it roll. It's pretty self-explanatory, Josh. We're in the corner? Okay. 49ers beat writer. Anyways, see for yourself. But when I press up on you in fucking person, you fucking shaking like a coward, voice lighter than my fucking baby, fam. What's up you with think that? I'm scared of you, Javon? What's up with that, fam? You think I'm scared of you, Javon? Fam, I don't give a fuck if you are or not. All I know is when I walked up on you, your fucking body temperature was fucking cold as ice. Straight you bitch. My body temperature? Straight right, bitch. Yeah. Your fucking balls shriveled up. Little dick nigga. Hey, Javon, do you think with me, bro. Javon, do you think you're representing me, the 49ers well right now? On this internet, bro. You Javon, do you think the 49ers are internet. proud of you? Did you catch that one line, that little dick? Yeah. Well, we thought that would be a good jumping off point to use against the ghost. <laughs> okay. Do you, you, like you called him a little dick N-word? Well, that, don't you? That's a That's a fun clip, right? I don't know why I'm so amused by that. No, yeah, that is funny. And I, it occurs to me that this is kind of similar to, like, my relationship with a lot of rappers is that I'm just this, like, nerdy white guy, and then I get these large, strong men just sort of threatening me from time to time. And that this this guy's a journalist, so he's even more beta than me. But, yeah, that's cute. Yeah, they can't call you a little dick anything, though. So that's the one advantage you have Well, over they can, but then they would Khan. have to also show their cock. Sure. Yeah, I guess relatively any dick can be small. Well, I, was just, I would just say, like, well, where's your dick? Like, to me, any guy who never lets their friends see their dick, I mean. Gay? Uh, no, but you could kind of read between the lines. It's probably <laughs> not. You know, I mean. Read between, read between the zipper fly. Um, I also have friends who I just assume they have a huge dick. And I don't know why. Like, without, having, without ha- them having said that much about it, it's like a poker game. 
It's like every, every guy is playing a poker because mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. dick is like your cards mm -hmm. and your cards. Everybody at the poker table, everything's out in the open except your cards. That's yeah. the one thing mm -hmm. that nobody gets to see. Uh. If you have a six pack, I'm going to know. Yes. Your haircut, I'm looking at it. Your car, your house. Your car, your pants, et cetera. Your dick is that one thing. And especially that's Holy like God. the same thing with girls and like the, the shape of their labia or their, their nipples. Most girls, not mine. Or n porn girls, but. Adam. You're a very serious poker player. Life is a poker game, and you everybody's know, just sitting there picking their dick. <laughs> you know all the terminology. I know, if not a royal flush, you have a full house. No, shut up. I am so sick of the hosts on this channel complimenting my dick. Listen to me. You have some shame. Listen to me. I want you to tell me right now, honestly, and I don't mind that Sydney's in here, that Mikey's in here, that Josh is in here, that a bunch of people are listening. I want you to tell me what my hand is. Your hand? Oh, yeah. You got, you got seven deuce offsuit, buddy. Can somebody translate that for me? Dred's got pocket aces. Josh is in. Dred's got pocket. Josh was just shaking his head and making a, a <sighs> grotesque facial expression. I got, I got, got a cool. Like, I don't like the offsuit thing. No, that makes it sound like it's disease. That, okay, I'm gonna be real with you. Seven two offsuit is the worst hand in poker. But also, I feel like I got something pretty soft. I think I got a king queen suited. No, king king jack suited. You can't tell me, we're going to get back to what yours is, but you can't tell me I have the worst hand in poker. No, you're right. For because Slo Sloby has, Sloby has seven deuce offsuit. Sloby won Kenobi, a member I'm, of my crew. I'm going to give you 10 deuce offsuit. It's a little bit better. Josh, can you give me a head nod, yes or no, if this is an improvement? He's giving me the. A eh, little bit more eh. high card value, still completely disconnected. No way you can really make a flush. It's rough. Okay, no we'll way I can make way. a flush. See, I, I, but seven deuce offsuit beats aces like eleven percent of the time or something. Okay, so one bad. out of ten times I'm going to make a girl come harder than you, or dread. I don't. I mean, honestly, it's all in the motion of the ocean. Now you're just going back to cliches. I'm just saying, I like know dudes with huge dicks that when I see them in porns, I'm like, oh wow, you really don't know how to use that thing too good. Okay, well this hasn't made me feel any better. I've also seen clips of myself where I was like, holy shit, like in the early days of plug talk where i'm like oh wow i got a lot better what were you doing wrong just there's a lot to it let's not get into it okay because whatever you were doing wrong i'm sure i'm still <laughs> doing wrong well <laughs> we latch on to this phrase we become obsessed with it right we go in to our mansion tour and from the moment we arrived at this place and First of all, let me say that we spent a lot of money, so we should have felt very, very comfortable. We rented out an entire guest house for 1300 bucks, a colonial mansion on the back of the property. We'd contacted them ahead. We'd paid 300 bucks for a tour. I greased the girl right when I got there, slid 40 bucks across the counter. A little cheap, I know. A C-note would have looked better. Okay. But the vibe we're getting right when we walk in is just woke theater chicks and they're just, you know how sometimes when you have to do a podcast and the air is just flat and you realize that that getting any sort of comedy out of the present energy is going to be like excavating a Baronosaurus fossil with a shovel. But you feel like that, you're talking about a live podcast or you're talking about when you sit down with your friends to do a podcast? Just, I, I, I don't know. Maybe this is an experience for me. You've got to be able to relate to this. Have you ever just sat down with somebody and the energy is so dead? Yes. You realize it's oh going to be God. a different kind of interview. It's going to have to be just straight up questions and, and earnest attempts to learn more about this person Dude, with no I humor or fun. Fucking 17 year old rappers who feel no obligation to actually communicate with me yeah. at times. Shit, I just I put out my fucking EP and just yeah. I've been trying to work on some beats and shit. I've been like. What what was your upbringing like? It was cool. Yeah. <laughs> That's just it, was, like, it was just people were chill. You, you know? just got to start digging. Yeah, people were chill. That's the yeah. type of thing <laughs> people say, too. Like, yeah, <laughs> shit was mad chill. People chill. definitely say. <laughs> so how's your relationship with your girl? It's chill. It's chill. Yeah, okay. Yeah. God, chill kind of like ruined conversation for like a whole generation of kids by just saying it's chill. Even when I was in high school, I kind of remember that being a thing that people would be like, Oh, how how was this? Oh, it's chill. He's chill. And I remember he being pissed off even at like 15. Like, that doesn't mean anything. Dude, it's me, it's exact same for me. Yeah. I remember we brought this kid up to Tahoe once, and the whole reason we brought him is because my best friend Alex was friends with him. Right. And so Alex had vouched for this kid. And then this kid, his name was Dylan, kept trying to bring all these other people to my parents' cabin. And I remember drilling him on, dude, who are these people? Just let me know they're, they're not. <laughs> He's chill. Yeah. They're chill. Are they are they employed? Are they criminals? Ah, oh, they're chill. 
okay. How old are they? Chill. Mm. Chilly one. They're welcome. Right. Sure. I'm done with this. That that thing happened to me too. And I remember I'm glad that you and I both lock on to chill was a word that we hate. But because especially as a podcaster, I have a lot of friends who are chill who want to be on the podcast. I mean, we can and it's move just, in chill circles. Chill does not get you far. The Ch- people Ch- chill to get you, you know, five thousand views on your podcast. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He, nobody's famous for being chill. Well, maybe like Seth Rogen, but that's like one guy. And the opposite of being Wiz chill Khalifa. is, of course, being lit. Being lit, yeah. And this podcast is lit as fuck, fam. No, but, and I mean, think about the key to like content in the long run is remaining uh, interesting to your audience. And I think you honestly kind of get to see it play out faster with Twitch because on Twitch, it's like you're giving them like seven, eight hours of yourself a day of just sitting there and just giving to the camera, right? And when you look at somebody like I Show Speed or even to a lesser extent, maybe like a Kai Sanat or a Gideon or whatever, it's just like they're just they're they're kind of unhinged it kind of feels like anything could happen it's Mm -hmm. very unexpected shit's gonna happen and like if you're just like a sort of well-composed person who's having an all right time in life i mean you're just not really like gonna do that well on social media that's not what they were in it for Mm -hmm. they want to see a freak show Mm -hmm. i mean that's what howard stern that's what his whole philosophy was that's why he blew up he but then he had to bring in this whole crew of fucking weirdos because he himself was boring at the time, mm-hmm. and even now is far more boring. I mean, he obviously he's, switched this whole shit up. But. He's the worst now. But right. he, he used to say that when the ratings were measured, which I guess was always at the top of the hour, that's when they would they the stations would measure how many people were listening to your show. He said he would look up to see when the big hand was on the 10, 10 minutes until the top of the hour, and he said he would just start saying the craziest shit he could think of for 10 minutes straight. And back then, the FCC, as long as you didn't say the F word, you could say virtually anything. But why is it? Why are you incentivized to do so well at the end of the hour like that? I don't know. That's just how, just it how the ratings worked. I just it was dinosaur traditional media. But I mean, think about stupid incentives like that, and then think about our current media landscape and all the stupid things that people do to basically make shit happen in this world these days. And it just tells you a lot about how the the medium commands mm-hmm. and controls the message. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're getting deep now. Yeah, that just you made me think of the the titles and thumbnails that we have to sift through in order to find quality content on YouTube. Right. I mean, how many times have you seen a video titled "He tried to press me" <laughs> in your feed? I know, and that's actually the crazy thing is that recently I've kind of had the conversation with everybody at No Jumper to be like, "Yo." I'm not feeling it anymore if y'all are just like trying to talk about all this drama shit on camera. Because at some point, some percentage of them figured out like, oh, I can get people to pay attention to me if I talk about all the drama at the office. Mm -hmm. Little tiny things of people not getting along that really don't have to be exposed. And it's like it doesn't have to be this way. It wasn't like this for a long time. But then at a certain point, people started to get the idea of like, oh, we could just talk about each other. And then that'll bring people into whatever. And it's like, I do think there's room for us to have conversations about, you know, who's getting along with who or whatever. But I just like kind of let everybody know this is not happening anymore. Like, I'm just not going to deal with people who work here just Mm. going to their stream to just lay out a bunch of stupid ass Mm. gossip about shit that's going on here or whatever. Who's got the, this is a little bit of gossip I want you to give me. Who's got the biggest poker hand here in the office? Best poker hand. Well, I mean, Flacco's going around claiming 10 inches. So. But he won't show it. Yeah, exactly. He won't, and according I, to your earlier theory, exactly. means he's got a small one. He's not. He's not in the running. But uh, And so, like, that, but that right there is an example about how, again, the medium command controls the message. Because it's like you're, you're talking about a bunch of people who probably throughout most of their life were decent people who were not feeling the need to be out talking shit about their friends and then all of a sudden, the platform, YouTube, basically, like, gives them money and views if they mm-hmm. do so. And so then they just start doing all this crazy shit. And it's like, what I'm trying to do now is actually kind of jumping in between that and being like, hey, I know you're incentivized to fucking make this kind of content or whatever, but you just have to stop. Like, it's just mm-hmm. not, I'm not cool with this anymore, you mm-hmm. know? So it's kind of, and it tells you a lot about the platform. YouTube, but my videos get pressed way, pushed way more if they're political If they have Mm. some sort of political leaning, whenever I get arrested at a women's march, I realized that video is going right to the number one spot of my last 10. Right. Whenever I go screw with a college, those videos always do well. And I don't mind it because I can still make the content intelligent and in my mind artistically credible. You just have to get arrested. Must. Or something along those lines. 
must. There has to be some sense of conflict because it's it, to buy in on a 20 minute video, you, and that's what's fucked up though. That's what's fucked up because when you look at Nuck Boys, they can kind of, or if you look at Mr. B. Steven, I mean, Mr. B's success is determined by his thumbnails largely. Yeah. But then at the same time, he just makes content that's so good that you kind of feel like a huge percentage of his fan base is just watching everything they upload. And I feel like Nug Boys have that. And sometimes with No Jumper, I've kind of felt like we got a little too far away from that in the sense of like us uploading vlogs that are just maybe not interesting enough. And that's like, but you're constantly dealing with that as a content creator of like, do I want to go full quality or do I want to go quantity? Because, you know, with you, like, you could put out a video every week or you could put out, you know, just like really wait until you 100% believe that that is the video. But then at the same time, it's like you got to pay rent. You, you feel like you have this obligation to your fans that you're going to have stuff coming out on a certain basis or certain schedule. Yeah, and I'm fine with that. I thought about that, too. Ideally, I would probably put out two videos a month and then go do stand up mm. and have other in-person comedy outlets. But right now, things are going well. I realized to keep growing on YouTube, at the very least, I got to put out one video a week. Right. And it's it's not like I'm in a concentration camp. Yeah. It's not like I'm in the Sudan, dude. Life is good, yeah. even if I'm not always doing exactly what I want to do. And I have to keep my mind on the business of YouTube. And I have to get arrested at an occasional woman. Right, but I have, to, I have to be real with myself about that sometimes because it's like I'll have a week where I do 10 interviews and then I spend almost no time working on the actual business, you know? Yeah. And it's just like... I don't know. That just is like kind of disturbing to me. And I'm like, was just having that conversation with my girl about plug talk too. It's like, we take our responsibility of showing up and shooting the content so serious. And then meanwhile, we're kind of lackadaisical about focusing in on other parts of the business yeah. that realistically, because I know a lot of people who run real businesses that are not based on them making content. And you know what they do? They wake up every day and they actually work on the business mm -hmm. because they don't have the option of just sitting in front of the camera and making content and being able to make some money and, and, and potentially get some new fans and stuff. But the reality is, is that that in a lot of ways is just like you treading water. In comparison to you really taking like big mm. steps in terms of the business that you're building mm -hmm. in the long run. And I'm constantly kind of wrestling with this now yeah. because in a lot of ways I look at like the last 10 years of my life or, or even before that, even since like 2006. And I'm like, you've made a lot of content, but there's got to be a lot more. Mm -hmm. to building a business than making content. And there's got to be a point where the diminishing the, there's diminishing returns on your content. Mm -hmm. And especially because I hold myself to a bizarre standard content-wise. Like a lot of times we're dropping multiple videos on the channel per day. I have a lot of weeks where I'm dropping five, six, seven interviews in a week. It's just like that to me even seems like more a more extreme version of procrastination mm -hmm. because I'm kind of doing that much mm -hmm. content instead of, again, just kind of focusing on the business itself. Yeah, I just want to remind you that when you interview a 19-year-old rapper who describes his childhood as chill, chill, and when you fuck Angela White in the ass on a couch, I never did anything. That's either. business, buddy. That's a great idea. Man. You fucked her in the vagina. Yeah, but just there's a big difference between doing business and making content. And when you look at the most successful people in this content space, when you look at Logan Paul, how much does he upload? Barely at all. He does the podcast like once a week. So he has that. You look at, you know, somebody like Jake Paul's killing it. He doesn't even upload to YouTube anymore. You look at Mr. Beast. He uploads, you know, every couple weeks, maybe once a month, whatever. But he has, he has other channels and stuff that kind of like bring in more money and stuff. But his main channel... Very infrequently. I was just watching. But Jake Paul got rich through daily uploads. And Logan Paul daily uploads too. But they the money that they made off of those double daily uploads is like nothing. Because they do huge brand deals and all this kind of stuff now. Dude, they were, he was getting 7 million views, Jake Paul, per video. Right. Daily uploads for a while. Which if you... That AdSense money... That's generational wealth if you do that for it's a couple cool, of years. It's cool, but Jake Paul making like 50 grand off a of video is fucking nothing when he's talking about him making like 10 million off a boxing match. That's true. With Logan Paul, there's a reason why he doesn't feel the need to upload a lot to his YouTube channels because he's making so much money doing like brand deals and, and creating products and stuff. Like the product category. You see this when you look at the list of who's made the most money in rap. It's like all dudes who made hella money from... Mm -hmm creating products it's but like you, burner with cookies it's dr dre with the headphones it's fucking kanye with the clothes it's it's uh, jay-z with all the management company and all the different businesses that he runs and stuff so uh, again it's like content is good content is a good way to get to a certain level in life but products and like real yeah. building a real business because that's what 
KSI does, as Logan Paul does. Mm-hmm. Like they built a big level of fame through doing content, and then they do business yeah. using the identity that they've created by yeah. making all this content. I think to like just make a ton of content and just act like that's the the future of business. Like you have to make content, you have to keep the fans happy. But that's like I can't just like keep making content for another ten years. Sure. Yeah, I mean, once you become one of those legacy guys, like Nelk, for instance, Nelk uploads one video a month and it does five million views. Right. But they've got their alcohol now, so they're set. Right. You got to become one of those legacy dudes, though, by putting out a shit ton of content. That's true. And there, I mean, there are people. Who, it's like that. That's one phase, the daily upload phase, or yes. I would I would say you're kind of in that phase for sure. I feel like I'm kind of like permanently trapped in that phase at this point, which I really don't have to be. To be. Yeah, yeah there's worse places to be, but just giving girls pearl necklaces while your wife licks your ass on a couch. You're doing the you, AD thing. You oppressed making a everything about too. porn. I'm sorry, man. I'll stop That's doing okay. that. Um, but uh, the fact that I don't know, it's just like I I just feel like there's like another chapter. There's another level. I have to keep doing content, but it's just like there. There's definitely and and it's weird because for me a lot of it goes to retail. It's like I I just have to do a store again. But then at the same time, there's so many good reasons to not do the store thing. It's a balancing act, man. I never at the end of every week, I never feel satisfied. Like I got everything done. I always wish I would have gotten able to been able to write a little bit more. Wish I would have been able to watch more comedy. Mm. Wish I would have been able to edit better. Wish I would have been able to stay out shooting a longer video. Wish I would have been able to work on that new merch design for a couple more hours. Right. But you have to give something up. And as long as you're logging more hours than the average person or the average competent competitor in your space, you're going to get ahead and years down the line you're going to look back and you're going to be very successful yeah. maybe what are we talking about <laughs> ghosts ghosts i want to tell you what oh, happened with this fucking, ghost. this fucking story no right, dude no. you're gonna love it. you're okay. gonna fuck i told you you were gonna but love aren't it aren't i just gonna see it in the video eventually no, at some point no anyway? fuck no. you're not putting it out no 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 something that happened that's the the crux of the story i'm getting at we okay. cannot put out in any way shape or really form. Uh, tell me about the thing you can't put out yeah Getting there. Okay, let's get there. Well, so, first of all, all these theater chicks, we realize right off the start, this is going to be awful. They're going to hate us. They're not going to think we're funny. And we've got five minutes max in the haunted house to do our piece before we get kicked out. Well, we get in there. They confiscate our Ouija board, first of all, and our candles, because we were going to conduct a seance right there in the haunted plantation mansion floor. But King Croc zeroes in on a portrait of Mr. Woodruff, uh-huh. the racist slave owner. He walks right up to it, and I'm egging him on, like, King Croc, what do you think about this guy? Not only is our little feeder girl tour guide there, but she also brought along a 65-year-old, five foot six security guy, too, to keep her safe. They had to bring in security because they knew we were going to be a problem. <laughs> well, King Croc looks the guy up and down, and he just says, I want to say to you, Mr. Woodruff, and I'm going to keep it a buck here, that you're a little dick. You hear a big gasp from the tour guide. It goes on. He starts saying that the relationship with Chloe, the slave he hung, wasn't consensual. She deserved a real man with a big dick and that he wants to give it to her good or at least her spirit. At which point I give him a dick pill. He grabs some lube and a condom and he starts getting ready to make spiritual love to Chloe right there. Right there in the haunted mansion. He pulled his dick out or he's just like handling the condom? I wish. That would have been a good idea. No. I I need to consult with you before these kids around. No. Oh. Actually, there were kids. I mean, it's a haunted yeah, there were, house. there were kids around. There were definitely kids around. Anyway. <laughs> okay, Not on our idea. tour. Our tour was private. Oh, okay. He keeps, he just keeps harping on the Javon Kinlaw thing from the 49ers. He keeps calling Mr. Woodruff a little dick. It's maybe on the fifth time doing so, the theater girl just screams, Get out! Get out now! <laughs> and sends us running back to our house right. on the plantation. We need to go back there and regroup and just hunker down for the rest of the night because clearly we're not welcome on the main property anymore. Well, we brought along with us a girl. We, um, she, she has, uh, she has herpes and we brought her along because we thought maybe that the ability to talk to ghosts is enhanced. If you have herpes, how do you know she has herpes and is she okay with you telling everyone she has herpes? Yeah, she, she came on our podcast once and that was her selling point to get a spot on our podcast. Well, that's smart, honestly. Like, why, why haven't we had a Patreon girl? Actually, I, I can think of a bunch of girls that we've had on have herpes and just didn't talk about it. Hey, but. plug talk, dude. Maybe you have her on. Yeah. 
I mean, she won't pass the pass test. I mean, dude, half the girls in the industry have herpes. If you're not having an outbreak, it doesn't show up on the thing. Hey, let's get rid of the stigma, people. Uh, Go out there, throw the condom on the floor, and start fucking. I'm convinced I'm immune. I think I probably so shouldn't say that. But. I have HSV one cold sores. I'm sorry, ladies. So I I have a theory that that helps me from getting HSV two. But I think chick- I got it from smoking blunts with Yuri. Just kidding, I don't have it. But Yuri always is like, oh, I can't pass the blunt. I have a cold sore. That motherfucker. <laughs> I was. You got me to smoke with that guy too. Well, what but not like sores. he'll he'll only not do it when he's actively having a cold sore thing. Okay. As long as I don't face fuck him, I'm in the clear. Yeah. This but you girl could. we brought. This girl we brought. Well, I, I'm going to be honest about something, Adam. We get back and we're just we're so in love with this clip and the quote, "Little Dick." Right. That and you're saying it over and over. Not. I was not saying it. Okay. I want that to be noted. But there, I'm not going to say who because I'm a man of honor. But there might have been a white man in our house with us who called another white man in the house with us a little dick. A white, a white on white. N-word. White on white with the A at the end. Okay. So nothing too serious. But then what happened? Well, King Croc's in there with us, and King Croc obviously thinks it's hilarious, doesn't give a fuck. But the chick, the chick. Herpy girl. She starts bringing up how she would never say that word. And I catch a note of judgment, and it worries me because I'm starting to think, dude, if she starts putting it out there. She's white? She's white. Okay. If she starts putting it out there. That the Danny Mullen crew are a bunch of guys hanging out in the deep south on a slave plantation using the N-word. <laughs> You've already got to set yourself up by being, being there in the first place, yeah. It's going to look bad for us. <laughs> and so me and Croc have a little conference. And King Croc, as you might know, our black friend King Croc, is about as conservative and as based, quote unquote, as it gets. Yeah. Using the word based is sort of like using the word chill, though. It's funny how both sides could say based and it means two totally different things. The left says based, too? Well, Lil B invented based, and it didn't really mean anything even close to what it means now. Uh, uh, based, see? Base is out of favor on the left. But, no, they would. They would say it. Maybe, well, like, the Destiny fans. They'll, they'll, they'll say something's based and mean, like, not what the right means when they say it. Anyway. Well, we start panicking. Like, this is bad. We don't want this. This could be bad for the brand. What can we do to make sure that this girl doesn't cancel the unnamed fellow in our house? Who's What's she going to say? Oh, a white guy said... The N word in the format of a meme. Some guy that nobody knows said the N word in the format of a meme that nobody and nobody was offended by it, including the black guy who was there. Like I don't know how effective this is going to be. I agree with you, but you can't be too careful, can you? No. So, King Croc sits her down and grabs her hand and says, "Listen, as a sign of solidarity, so I know you're not a racist. I need you to say the N word." This girl who is adamantly against it, who seems very judgmental of it being used, and who is uh, getting her PhD or her master's right now. She won't do it. It takes 30 to 45 minutes of cajoling before this girl very hesitantly repeats the phrase that Javon Kinlaw used against Grant Cohn. And after she says it, Danny Mullen, who might have been hiding behind a recliner in the living room, Presses the stop button on his voice note. <laughs> you got her. I got her, dude. <laughs> I got her. We got a woke chick. A black man got a woke chick to say the N-word. Was she upset? She doesn't know. Oh, you didn't tell her that you're recording? Nope. What the fuck? How do you not celebrate? Well, I mean, King Rock and I were ecstatic afterwards, but I, we kept it on the DL. I, I, I would think that even most black people would agree that giving the word this much power, that you're allowing it to just like have this much presence, this is what you're doing with your knights to try to convince some random <laughs> white girl to say it. I don't think that this is like really congruent with the nature of why we as a society have kind of decided that white people should not say the black word. I or agree. The, the, not, not the black word, the N word. Yes. Right? Yes. The black word. The the (laughs) black word. 89 years old. (laughs) (laughs) The black word. Dude, I'm with you. But this is, I mean, this is the level of, that we have to resort to as white people. It becomes an hour-long espionage operation just to make sure our bases are clear. Haven't we had enough America? Is it a time for us to move on? Right. No, definitely. I have a a topic that I wanted to bring up. Hit me with it, Adam. Today... I'm gonna I'm gonna read the full the full post so we can get the full context of exactly what was being said. But as you know, Dwayne Wade has a uh, daughter who a daughter who transitioned from being 
his son. Oh, my you God. You don't know this. No. No. You don't know this. That's very interesting. You can't keep track. You can't keep track. Dude, how many fucking things does Hollywood Unlocks post in a day? Anyway, the title of the blog post is Dwayne Wade's ex-wife accuses him of exploiting and pressuring their daughter Z- Zaya's gender change for financial gain. So this has been like a pretty big story in the media and everything because, you know, amongst the sort of like mainstream black world probably not that many examples that you could think of of somebody famous whose fucking kid wants to transition in their early teens, right? Because this is such a big uh, discussion that people are always having sort of in the abstract about kids transitioning and what's appropriate and at what age they should be allowed to start taking puberty blockers or whatever the fuck they want to do. And so you've had a lot of people like fucking Boosie who's kind of got dragged through the mud because he had the gall to say that Dwayne Wade was fucked up for letting his son transition, whatever the fuck. What was the child born as, man or woman? A man. Born as a man, look wanted at, to become a woman. Look at the picture on the left, and then look at the picture of the person on the right. Not a bad-looking chick. Okay. <laughs> Still underage, but... <laughs> it's a man, all right? No. It's not creepy it if I say an underage boy. Do not... How dare you? Uh, i But anyway... um. Where were we? You scrolled past it. Okay, here we go. Dwayne Wade's ex-wife, whose name I could never pronounce in a million years, has reportedly filed legal paperwork this week as she accuses her former partner of exploiting their 15-year-old daughter, Zaya, for financial gain while making a string of other serious allegations against the former NBA star. According to The Blast, who claimed to have obtained the court docs, his ex-wife believes that Zaya is being pressured into transitioning to become female by her dad who she says is poised to profit from the move she stresses that considering zaya is only 15 years old she wants the court to rule in her favor by preventing her daughter from officially making her gender change until she's an adult i have concerns that Dwayne may be pressuring our child to move forward with the name and gender change in order to capitalize on the financial opportunities that he has received from companies her attorney, Mark Gross, continued that Dwayne could ultimately make a fortune from potential companies looking to work with Zaya, including but not limited to deals with Disney. This matter has been highly reported on in the media, and there will be likely well, there, there will likely be a media pressure on the minor child. I'm gonna be honest with you. Yeah, I don't know anything about Dwayne Wade. I don't know anything about his character or what he's like as a person. If people generally consider him to be a liar or whatever, the idea that he would be coercing his child into wanting to transition their gender and that his current girl would be on board for it and that the kid would gladly be going along with it. This is like a deeply cynical perspective, right? Like this is very hard for me to believe that there's any financial status that he might be able to reach that would actually make him feel like this was a, was a, a real decision. And when I look at like his ex-wife, I mean, think about her motivations, you know, she probably has all kinds of reasons why she wants to get at this motherfucker. Well, let's break it down for the financial thing. Right. Absolutely. There are opportunities that come to those who transition. An example. What what are those opportunities besides just being on TMZ every fucking day? Josh, do you know of him like seeming to have benefited from this financially? Like, well, let's, there's, he looks good to the woke crowd for sure, but that's not financial. That's so nice. Much. Yeah, it's, they have made it very public. It's that's a good fair. Move. Yeah, the going having a child transition is the great eraser, especially if on the team airplane you might have grabbed a cocktail waitress's ass on the way to the Orlando Magic game. Okay. Well, let me say this, Adam. I don't know if you heard about this. Did you see? Speaking of Mormons. The guy from the Book of Mormon recently transitioned and has been transitioned for less than a year. Not the South Park guys, but one of the performers, very talented performer in the show, transitioned. And within, I think, two or three hundred days was invited to the White House to interview Joe Biden on various matters. Wow. That's how quickly your profile can increase, especially if you already have a little bit of notoriety. Being the child of Dwayne Wade certainly qualifies. It is lighter fluid on a, a little grass fire. But this is this thing that people do where they they perceive how a person is benefiting from a situation. Mm-hmm. And then they assume that the facts that led up to these benefits 
are probably a conspiracy theory. The same way that people saw me when I had the guy put the gun in my face. I'm on Logan Paul's podcast the next day and I'm on fucking Inside Edition and I'm doing all this media and stuff and I'm getting all these views from it and people couldn't help but think, oh, he must have faked the whole thing mm -hmm. because look at how he's benefiting from it. And it's like, no, I'm just making the best of a situation. So mm -hmm. it's like the idea that he would actually be willing I mean, I just think you would have to know a lot more about a person in sure. order to assume that they were actually capable of this kind of lunacy. And it also stands for reason somebody on Twitter showed me that Dwayne Wade apparently made $200 million during his time in the NBA. Okay. He's got a lot of money. Doesn't need to profit much more. And it's not like people who have a lot of money don't want to make more money. I'm just sure, saying sure. that this is probably not somebody who feels a lot of the same financial pressures that sure. other people feel. And I'm not saying yay or nay he did this for any reason, but I think we should get to the bottom of it. <laughs> I think a good way to start would be for Mikey and Sid over here. Mikey, right? I got his. I think Zaya, Zaya needs to come on this podcast and let us talk to her. We'll talk to we'll talk to Zaya. We can get to the bottom. And of this. I will apologize for saying I think she'll like that I said she was pretty. That was not meant to be sexual, Adam. And I'm sorry for the, oh, the pronoun it was a bobble. Sexual pretty. That okay. Was, that was uh, the bobble was bad on my part. Well, I'm you sorry, could say Zaya. you could say a baby is pretty, right? If you meet my fucking two year old daughter and you say, "Oh, she's so pretty," I'm going to watch my mouth when that's I'm complimenting the looks of your female That's a non-sexual pretty. Yeah, yeah. You could say pretty in a non-sexual way. Okay, okay. So I nailed it. But I want these two to scrub Dwayne Wade's Twitter starting around the year 2016, really amping up around the year 2020. I think we can find the breadcrumb trail. I think we can see where he's at <laughs> ideologically, and that'll give us a little bit of a clue. Okay? I'm going to go out on a limb and say I don't think Dwayne Wade knew a whole lot about trans people before he ended up in this situation. Maybe not. I don't know. I'm just trying to. Uh, it seems like you got your mi your mind made up about I mean, this. I'm Maybe down to get money. deeper into it. I just think that the idea that this would be a logical course of action for him. And trust me, I'm somebody who's kind of watched this play on the public eye, and I have I have wondered, you know, like what is the appropriate age for a kid to start this transition? I don't fucking know. And I assume that there are some parents who rush their kids into it yes. too quickly. And we've heard horror stories for sure, especially when it comes to some of these lunatic progressive parents or whatever. They're just in a race to try to impress everybody by transitioning their kids at a super young age or whatever, but I mean, to put that on him... Is it too late to transition Bossa Nova? Mm. It looked really good for the studio. Ever since I saw that Ice Spice fit. Well, actually, I didn't see him in a gray miniskirt, but I heard about it. It sounds like he's already on his way. Yeah. Uh, how far have they gotten into it with Dwayne Wade's daughter? Oh, Has I don't know. I, I doubt that there's been any... Chemical or well, I Adam's assume made a cutting they, motion. They gotta be on pu puberty blockers or some shit, right? So that's my issue with it. And granted, my only research on this subject really is watching the Daily Wire What is a Woman documentary. Oh, my God. Have you seen it? Definitely what, what you should base your entire opinion on. And yes, I did. I spent like 13 fucking bucks to watch that shit. It was good, though, right? No, it was stupid as fuck. What didn't you like about it? What do you disagree with? I thought it was very insincere. I mean, I do. I enjoy the theater of like putting an idiot on camera and especially like the revelation that a lot of these gender studies professors are fucking morons mm -hmm. and that they don't make sense on anything. But I think that there is like a much more nuanced conversation to have about what a woman is just because I think that a lot of people think that the explanation is a lot simpler than it really is because the you know there is like performative womanhood like if you put a long wig and a dress on it's like you're gonna kind of look like a woman to me even though you're not biologically a woman or whatever but I, I just have had this discuss discussion with like destiny and like ha I've listened to destiny talk about it in such length that I just think it is a far more nuanced question than that documentary ever even began to hint at that sure. do that documentary to me felt more like a it's like satire. It reminded me of Borat. Mm -hmm. It's like, look, we're going to get the dumbest people we can. We're going to put them on camera, and then we're going to ask them a bunch of questions that we know they're not ready for. It's basically like, like if you did you get any like profound intellectual stimulation from Stephen Crowder doing the change your mind thing at colleges? No, it was no, pure because you know what it is. Yeah. It's like, yeah, we're going to ask a bunch of nineteen year olds about their fucking pronouns or whatever and make them look stupid. I agree with you that. There, so I have no problem with obviously the transgendered people. Like I call you by your preferred pronouns, no issue with it whatsoever. Right. But one thing that documentary did draw some attention to for me. Sorry, we're being photographed for the thumbnails right mm -hmm. now, and at this point in the show, it's always important that we look good. Right. I'm waiting for me. The one thing that did ring true for me was the argument they made that a lot of these pharmaceutical companies are. Supporting the transgender movement, not because 
He's not even pointing at you, dickhead. <laughs> Dude, I'm fucking... <laughs> Listen to me. Oh, Phil's telling me my hair looks weird. I think it looks quite good, Phil. Oh, I had my hoodie on, so my hair looks weird? I was wondering, does the photographer tell me to fix my hair? But I guess it's fair. The pharmaceutical companies, to me, that documentary made it seem plausible that they are very concerned with the health care of trans children, not because they think it is good for them psychologically long term, mm. but because it is profitable for the pharmaceutical companies and now and right. long term because the, of all the maintenance. If I own a pharmaceutical company and it is basically like the law of the land that as a, as a, a corporation that you have to profit maximize yeah. and you realize like, oh, we have customers out there who want to utilize our services. What are you gonna do? You're gonna fucking engage, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna try to encourage as many trans surgeries as possible. That's yeah. just that's capitalism, buddy. Yeah, I guess so. But that I think is dangerous. Oh yeah. If when you're 13 years old, I thought a lot of things when I was 13 years old. I remember pausing for the picture. You gotta watch Lex Friedman interview Kanye. Kanye keeps I writing did. down things during the podcast. Yeah. I, when it's I like was, the most annoying. I've never seen anyone do anything that annoying on a podcast. This is close, though. <laughs> Phil coming in here and taking pictures of us with an audible shutter that's going. Yeah, it's close. Yeah. What I'm saying Daring. is, fuck off, buddy. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Wait, 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 wait. So, I forgot. See, Phil, this is the problem. I don't know what I was saying now. Yeah. I, when I was younger, played paintball, professional paint, not prof semi-professional semi paintball. Okay, I was on a good team. And we would go to tournaments, and we had sponsors, and it was really cute. When I hit my growth spurt, I remember, and I would tell my dad this all the time, Dad, I wish I was shorter. I wish I would stop growing because I want to be the best snake player in paintball. Off the break, I want to be able to make it around the Doritos and then dive in headfirst into the snake and play it like Yosh Rao does on Dynasty. And he's only 5'3", and I'm already 5'9 and growing, and it really pisses me off. And I want to do something about this. And that was my thing. That was my hang-up for two years. And I would cry about it that I was getting taller. I remember additionally when I was younger, like hating my bird nose really bad. I mean, like, oh, it's, it's I'm never going to get laid with my nose. Girls make fun of me for it at school and shit. I remember these issues occupying my young mind for a period of years. And if there had been an experimental surgery that TikTok and YouTube and society was encouraging and st stamping of approval as safe, I might have considered it. But do you think... Because I feel like that's the ultimate test of you as a human being is when your kid comes to you and they say, I am gay. And you have to decide if you believe them or not. Because it's all poker. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's all like, a poker just, game. Because, okay, if your kid seems gay, you're yeah. just going to be like, okay, I get it. Like, I know people who fucking think that their kids are gay and their kids are like eight. And they're, they're, they're not like coaxing them into it or anything. But like. They feel like there's probably a above average chance that their kid is gay just because of certain things that they've picked up on. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I respect that. Like I, I feel like those people that I'm thinking of, if, if they if if at some point their kid were to say I'm gay, they would just be like, Yeah, that's cool. But then at the same time, I feel like so, at some point your six year old kid is gonna say, like, I like boys. And mm -hmm. you're gonna be like, No, you don't. Shut exactly. The fuck up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I think, and I think you would agree though, if all the evidence sort of points to, I don't know. What do you think? If all the evidence points to somebody's son or daughter is really identifying with the opposite sex, and there were kids like this in my elementary school, so I'm not completely unsympathetic toward the transgender cause and helping young kids. I remember there were kids at my elementary school, boys, who were out in the field with the girls choreographing dance routines. And those kids grew up to be very gay individuals who were on the cheer team in high school. That's what I'm saying. After like, all the dudes that I knew who ended up being gay in high school, like, uh -huh. it, it, the dudes I knew at, like, 12 or 13 who ended up being gay, like, yeah, I kind of I kind of knew at 12. Mm -hmm. Before they, way before they actually came out. Mm -hmm. I would just say... Let's wait until 18 before we take the dick, before we take the boobies, before we give, the pu give you the puberty blocker, because the kinks aren't worked out yet. Mm. If you chop somebody's dick off and turn it into an innie, it's not as if that thing is going to be a, perf a perfectly functioning vagina. Right. And until they understand that and they're adults, let's just hold off. Yeah, but at the same time, man, if you got like 
you know how kids are. When you're 15, 16, I mean, you got your own fucking opinions on shit. But we shouldn't validate those. 15-year-olds are retards. <sighs> but you're telling me that if your kid is, is has a full-on lisp and he don't want to play sports, he just want to work on the school play and yeah. he wants to talk about a bunch of gay celebrities and he's got fucking cool James Charles hair and he's like working on mascara and everything. Although you are right. Maybe you should just be a gay man. I think you need to have that conversation with your kid. Like, Let's are you sure out. you don't want to just be like a yeah. really cool gay dude yeah. and not a chick? Yeah. Either way, you're sucking dick, <laughs> but your sexual tool is going to perform a hell of a lot better right. if you keep the dick. And I'll tuck it, dude. If he if he wants to have that conversation and he insists he wants to be a woman and he's not a gay man, I will personally go in there with the roll of duct tape and attach that thing to his asshole so he can wear his tights and nobody will see the bulge. Have you seen all the videos of people who detransition, though, and how fucked it is? Detransition? Yeah. So they tried to become a woman. They realized it wasn't for them, and then they tried to come no, back. No, they did the whole thing. They cut the and cock off? Yes, and then there's no chance of coming back. Because once you start pumping yourself full of those hormones and you cut your dick off or whatever, like, it's fucking crazy. And it's honestly, like kind of weird that it gets so ignored by the media because to me this being a phenomenon I've, I've probably seen like 20 fucking videos without and this is me not trying i follow libs with tiktok on twitter but it's not like i'm really trying to like seek out fucking stories about people who transition and then regret it but it happens and it's like doesn't that seem like it should be a new york times fucking yeah. article at some point or whatever i see the left media just completely turning their eye, a blind eye to it but i've read about some freaky mm -hmm. fucking sexual shit that happens like like somebody who got their fucking I, th I think it was somebody who got their they they got a penis they had a vagina they got a penis yeah started having these long ass hairs growing f like out of their urethra that were like insanely fucking like painful to pull out so like now, you erect over i have this you wet? i have this mental image of yanking a long thick hair and just feeling it travel through my urethra ah! As soon as I found out that that might be part of the trans experience, I was just like, what the fuck, dude? This I'm, I'm thinking totally differently about this now. Yeah. It's like clearing a shower drain, but your yeah. fucking penis is the shower drain. The person you're referring to, I believe they're interviewed in the Daily Wire, What is a Woman documentary. That might it be was, what I saw. It yeah. was a woman who was a really high-powered executive or just a, a, a chick who was dominating on Wall Street, and she was always a little bit masculine, and she got essentially talked into, though a lot of it was her decision too, she got talked into becoming a man. She did it all, the hormone blockers, um, take the butcher knife to the penis, all that and then she regretted it tremendously. Right. You can't fake that. That's not Ben Shapiro spreading misinformation. This is a person who tried it and realized, yes, hair is growing out of the constructed penis. Her heart is much less healthy. She's going to die, the doctors have told her, probably more than a decade earlier than she would have had she stayed off right. these chemicals. Cancer. If you are taking estrogen or testosterone and it's not congruent with your sex, your chances of cancer go through the roof. Mm. And these are things we don't talk about. And yeah, dude, gender dysphoria is a real thing. Again, I've seen it. I've seen it in rural Orangevale in Sacramento where I grew up, where there was no TikTok yet. There were no liberal politicians pressing any sort of agenda. Right. These people were gen genuinely gender dysphoric and probably some of them, in some cases transgendered. I just think people need to be fully educated and adults before they do the life altering stuff. Yeah. But then also, yeah, because it's like if you're 18, 19 and you choose to make that decision, I guess I get it. If you're 15 or 16, like, I don't know, because if, if you're the parent and then your 15 or 16 year old kid ends up being a 25 year old that regrets being given these puberty blockers and all this other shit as a kid. But I mean, you do make a lot of experience. You, you make a lot of decisions at 15 or 16 that do impact your adult life right but you can always change it if you didn't kind go to of. college you, you can, can always kids. go back to college but even yeah, but, but even like having kids like yeah you could have a kid at 16 and there's no fucking law that's going to make you have to not have a kid at 16 but at the same time you could give the kid up for adoption mm -hmm. you know it's like there's a lot of things you could just make that part of your normal life whereas like yeah there are things that you can't get back at a certain point mm -hmm. yeah dude know. and if you get your dick cut off you can't come anymore right <laughs> how satisfying is that going to be they're going to construct a, a clitoris out of your pinky finger. What are you doing? I know, like the the fact that they're like cut a dick out of your leg or something, like make you a dick. 
That's pretty wild, right? It's kind of cute. I've it's never seen the videos or anything. I feel like if we saw the videos of what it's actually like, that we would be pretty like stunned. Can we but, pull up a video here, Josh? Please, no. But uh, the, the, the thing that, because this is the conversation that always happens. This is a real edgy conversation. But like the, tr the rate of suicide with trans people is super fucking high, right? And it's like, it's been suggested. And I, I believe that the rate is like similarly, extremely high, similarly, extremely high if you transition. It's mm -hmm. like it doesn't change. And then mm -hmm. like the, a lot of the people that I think that are completely miserable once they transition, they're in a lot of cases, I think they were somebody who was completely depressed and miserable. They thought maybe because of the media, maybe just because this is what their brain was telling, they thought, oh, if I transition, then I'll be okay mentally mm -hmm. and then they transition mm -hmm. and they're still fucking miserable mm -hmm. and they realize that they probably shouldn't have transitioned in the first place so they have then, all these health problems and bills exactly what the f is life even worth living at that point once you realize you've made this big of a mistake yeah i think it's tough man and even at 25 i was an idiot and i wouldn't trust any life-altering decisions i don't know it's it's complex dude if i could have got tattoos when i was 13 i'd have a big ass rage against the machine sleeve oh no longer a fan of rage huh I mean, whatever. I'm just glad I don't have a sleeve of them. A bunch of a bunch of multimillionaires singing about the evils of capitalism and how we need to destroy that, the system. I want that monk burning himself yeah. right here. And then I want like an anarchy sign, rage with like the yeah. fist. The upside down American flag on Dude, fire. Imagine that was on my fucking arm for when I was 13. I would have to just get it covered up. I'm not going to be the the guy with the rap podcast who has a Rage Against the Machine sleeve. <laughs> dude, I I had this fucking idea once, dude. Well, I mean, Rage Against the Machine, they're less credible bands. In True, my age, but... it would have been a Sum 41 tattoo in my Oh, age. God. Dude, I wanted to get a tattoo because I trained a lot of jiu-jitsu when I was in high school. I said this sentence out loud to somebody at the gym who had a bunch of tattoos. I was like, yeah, tattoos are cool. I sort of want one to represent my jiu-jitsu. I was thinking about getting an octopus fighting a lion. <laughs> I hate I wouldn't be in this chair right now if I had an octopus fighting a lion tattooed on my body anywhere. Would I, I? I know a guy. You wouldn't associate with me. Just say it. I have two tattoos I want to tell you about. Okay. I have a friend who has across his back, and I, I don't even remember this dude's name, but it was a dude I used to hang out with when I was like 19 or whatever. Across his back in varsity front font. Brotherhood. <laughs> <laughs> and i thought it was pretty tight when he got it like i'm like 18 19 i'm like that's fucking sick dude it looks like he's wearing a fucking letterman jacket at all times brotherhood bro brotherhood you can't turn your back on the dudes who make it sure you okay at night dude yeah exactly because that's like the whole hardcore thing they're just like obsessed with this narrative that like somebody has turned their back on you or, or something bro he went up to reno and he was hardcore dancing at that hood show yeah. and you know that dude i hate who's got the really big gauges was there dude that's not brotherhood he's not welcome back here at the underground cafe brotherhood yeah this is our coffee shop this is our coffee shop <laughs> Those were the. I was thinking about that the other day. I went to a couple hardcore shows when I was in high school. I dabbled. Remember the dance, the two step? Oh god, dude, there was this. I used to do it all the time. You used to two step. I've never talked about that on here, but I was super into it because when I got out of high school, I thought that shit was so tight. Hardcore dancing. Yes. So everybody's just. We need to do this. Adam's doing the two step. I could right actually now. do it if I was standing up right now. It's kind of like you just are like two putting step, one dude. leg over the other, over and over, and then you're doing some stupid motion with your arms. Can we please? Can he get? Can we put on some every time I die and can Adam <sighs> two step for us? I would love to do that. Okay, go on YouTube right now and type two step dancing hardcore. And you I want to right now. People need to understand this subculture. I just decided I want to do a video on it. It is so embarrassing that in some cases grown men are opening up pits and doing this dance oh, yeah. to a bunch of guys who are fry cooks who also play bass guitar. Play this one. We have a tutorial. Play the yes, second one. We have a tutorial. The second one and, and turn the audio off. Oh, I got, I got good, oh 13 years maybe, ago. Maybe just perfect. turn it down. This little. is a period piece. No, too. you got to turn the music up a little bit, actually. Oh, high school performance. Like, like, 
this is the worst setting for it. You're literally in a fucking gymnasium, and you know this is wrong. This shit is supposed to be taking place in like an Elks Lodge or like some shitty little club a or converted something. converted church stage. Exactly. A fucking... Because you know what's fucked up is like moshing kind of makes sense when it's like a small room where nobody has any room to go, so everybody's hitting in, into each other. With this, it's like you're in a fucking basketball. Like there would have to be a thousand people in that room in order for it to be filled. And right now all there is is this horse girl in the CHS sweatshirt going, I'm but, watching. And that dude looks exactly like, yeah, and there's like one chick in there and they're all just fighting each other to try to impress her. Uh, moshing, I miss it. Bring me back. Moshing is one thing because moshing is you reacting without any kind of censorship to what's happening. You're feeling the music. Your body is moving. See, that it can be cathartic. Is, that's supposed to be what it is. It's yes. supposed to just be like you letting loose and it's just totally crazy. But then in reality, it looks more like this. It's just this weird forced thing. And this is... This is like chicks judging each other on their handsprings on the cheerleading squad. It's yeah. becoming high school because I knew a kid once named Colton Johnson who was really into the scene. And one time after him and I went to a show, he was like, those kids from Bakersfield, worst hardcore dancers I've ever seen. Mm. When the kid was picking up pennies, dude, it was so trite. Well, like his form was I just... I was the king of that shit because I'm from the Boston area going to shows in Boston. It's like the most violent hardcore scene, especially during that area or era, late 90s, early 2000s. It's like the most violent hardcore scene that's ever existed. And then every other place I've been to, New York, touring all over the country, California for hardcore shows, it's just like super pussy in comparison, which is is fine. I actually think that's probably a good development yeah. for the future of this art form. And humanity. Yeah, but definitely as a kid, I was just like, holy fuck. Like, Because I, I was actually getting the shit beat out of me at shows when I was like 15. Like really like getting concussions and stuff yeah. and people jumping on my head and stuff. Probably by a guy who has like a tattoo shop and two kids yeah. who was beating up a 15-year-old. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. It, it's <laughs> hardcore dancing. The two-step is the most peaceful form of the dance that we've seen part of it also is just you spin around like the tasmanian devils with your with your fist clenched oh that's one like a little windmill yeah <laughs> windmill yeah that kind of went out of style i think <laughs> sorry i'm not but, up yo, on the drums. i saw a kid get maced at one of these shows because this, he was from out of town i saw a dude get his head caved in with a hammer at one of these shows but not that's at hard. a basketball that's, court that but is hard this singer let me just tell you last thing i want to say on this podcast before we wrap it up is that this singer fucking triggers me because this was literally the dude who was fucking the chicks that I wanted to fuck yeah. when I was like 18. It was yeah. like this dude with this kind of like weirdly tight button up shirt and his yep. long black hair and he's super skinny and he shrieks into out. the mic and his band has a hundred MySpace followers. Yep. And there were girls that I had hardcore crushes on that I couldn't get close to because they were fucking with dudes like this. So fuck him. Mm -hmm. And I hope that you work at Sears right now. I would actually love to know what this dude's doing right now. A lot of them died.